In this final module, we are focusing on the question how to enhance the transboundary crisis management in the EU. So this is a question which looks in the future, to the future, and tries to draw from the experiences which we have collected in the past modules to think about ways of enhancing a legitimate form of crisis management in the EU. Are there some recipes which can be advanced uh, in order to enhance capacity, or um, are there no straight lessons we can draw? If we look across um, the various crises um, that have been discussed in the past few um, modules um, here, uh, we can focus on a number of areas uh, which allow us to talk about a variety of transboundary crises in the European Union. One is um, clearly the kind of the types of crises where the traditional distinction is between acute incidents, um, acute um, problems such as um, ash clouds um, being uh, stopping air traffic or terrorist attacks and such like. We've got creeping crises such as pension time bombs, uh, social problems emerging from youth unemployment and such like. We've also got different crises in terms of their impact, those which are largely of a local or of a regional kind but have much wider European implications. For example, a blackout in one area of um, the European Union rather than everywhere. Um, and then we've got those crises which are of a European-wide nature, and the financial crisis, one might argue, was one of those European-wide crises. So one needs to distinguish types of crisis. The second kind of area where you can sort of find distinctions between the transboundary crises uh, that we have looked at and which are deserving more attention, uh, we can distinguish between three different types. One is the traditional domain of crisis management, which largely deals with civil contingencies, with protection, with emergency measures. The second area where we can talk about domains of crisis are those questions which relate to the consequences of market integration. So here the tension which one can observe across policy fields is how can one combine um, market liberalization and integration with questions of EU solidarity and also the question of demands for national sovereignty in terms of policy making. And then the third kind of a, a domain of crisis management is this area of backsliding uh, as discussed, where here member states are uh, um, retracting on the normative core what it is to be part of the European Union. And then finally, we also need to distinguish in terms of the competency of crisis, namely what kind of legal authority exists at the EU level, whether it is at the heart of EU competence or not. Secondly, we also need to then discuss uh, the deficits in transboundary crisis management. So what did we observe here? And here we can identify four different types of deficits. One is a central authority deficit. So here the argument is that there's a lack of oversight, especially at the centre, and leadership at the centre. Member states do what they want, there's no clear direction. That is one fundamental criticism which can be traced across different types of crisis. The second type of deficit, which one can diagnose, is a so-called prescriptiveness deficit. So here the argument is that too much flexibility exists, nobody really knows how they're supposed to behave, and therefore we have problems in terms of inconsistency of by member states when responding to particular requirements or demands. So here, therefore, more prescriptiveness of rules might be an answer. But a third criticism goes in a completely opposite direction and argues there is a lack of flexibility. So here the criticism is there is far too little um, kind of approach or flexibility in EU provisions that allow for different degrees of vulnerability and different types of capacities across EU member states to deal with different types of crises. And finally, there's also this question about the subsidiarity deficit. So here, the kind of fundamental question is how much should be in the hands of member states or in other uh, bilateral or multilateral organizations rather than inside the EU, where one might argue this has a centralizing instinct. So here, we have four deficits, all of them arguably going in opposite directions, and these are fundamental to any form of discussion we need to have in order to advance transboundary crisis management. So, we have these four deficits. Now, one of the problems is that it's not as if each deficit fits only one crisis. On the contrary, a single crisis can actually be criticised from different angles for different types of deficits. What this means is that we have a multitude of ways of thinking about how to improve transport crisis management at the EU or in the EU. Um, this gives us, roughly speaking, four broad approaches to crisis management, or four scenarios of how one could improve EU crisis management. 
at any given stage in, in, in the crisis management cycle. One answer is simply to rely on ad hoc responses to a crisis, to deal with the crisis when it happens and to make up the response on the spot in order to fit the crisis. This has the benefit of being flexible and it has the benefit of taking place at the member state level, but it has the weakness of often not being enough to deal with the transboundary crisis. The second type of response could be to strengthen the rules for what member states should do, but allow the action to take place at the member state level. Again, this has a potential disadvantage of member states doing different things and not consistently responding to a crisis. The third element is the idea of strengthening the EU level action, but in doing this in working with the member states in what we called multi-level governance. And the fourth option is simply the idea of strengthening the EU capacities, both in terms of stricter rules at the EU level and in terms of stronger enforcement mechanisms or stronger authority at the EU level. So what? What can we learn from this? The outcome of this is really that there isn't a single silver bullet in terms of crisis management. There's not one size fits all. Traditionally, answers to crisis in the EU have been more Europe, more European level policy, more power to the European level institutions. In the current context, it might be necessary to explore other options as well. And these are the four scenarios just mentioned. The second lesson from all of this is therefore, or consequently, the need to think very carefully, not only about which level tasks are best dealt uh, best or more appropriately dealt with at the EU level or the national level, but also how they're best dealt with. Does a particular type of crisis require strict rules and clear guidelines, or is it best dealt with in a more ad hoc and flexible type of way? So the final conclusion to all of this is that rather than look for a single way to improve crisis management or transboundary crisis management in the European Union, uh, it, it is important to appreciate the need for several different ways of organising crisis management, to consider the strengths and weaknesses of these different ways, and even to be open to the idea that some aspects of crisis management, such as detecting a crisis or analysing a crisis, could be done at different levels from the subsequent levels, uh, subsequent status of crisis management, such as making decisions or communicating these decisions or taking political responsibility for crisis management.